Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Hal Levinka, and I'm the event director of the bookstore, and I am thrilled today to be collaborating again, again with our friends at the New York Review of Books for the continuation of our panel series. Uh, tonight, Fiction in a Time of Crisis, featuring Valeria Luiselli, Ben Lerner, Ayad Akhtar, and Dino Mingistu, and moderated by Elaine Blair. While the pandemic has taken a toll across all of our lives, virtual programs like the one you're about to see have become bright spots in our days. And I'm gonna give a huge thanks to our guests for joining us tonight. So to a little bit of housekeeping before we get started, you should be able to see and hear our presenters, but they cannot see or hear you. So if you have any questions, please click on the Q&A button here at the bottom of the screen to submit them. We'll be asking those at the end of the program. There's also a chat button here through which I'll be posting a link to purchase tonight's books by tonight's authors, uh, as well as a special subscription offer for NYRB for tonight's attendees. A caveat for tonight's event, we are all at the mercy of our home internet connections and server loads, so please bear with any technical issues that might arise. We will try to solve those quickly. And finally, we've scheduled a whole host of spring programming leading into the summer, so head over to our website and sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. One that I do want to mention this Thursday, our NYRB Classics series continues with a discussion of a new collection of Tepi stories with translator Robert Chandler uh, in, in conversation with Taisha uh, Kitaskaya, which this program is on our website now and taking registrations. And finally, I want to give a huge thanks to Daniel Mendelson for helping to put tonight's program together. So now a little about tonight's guest and we will get started. Valeria Luiselli is the author of Sidewalks, Faces in the Crowd, The Story of My Teeth, Tell Me How It Ends, an Essay in 40 Questions, and Lost Children Archive. She is the recipient of a 2019 MacArthur Fellowship and the winner of two Los Angeles Times Book Prizes and the Carnegie Medal, among other awards. Ben Lerner's most recent book is The Topeka School. He has received fellowships from, from the Fulbright, Guggenheim, and MacArthur Foundations, among other honors. Ayad Akhtar is the author of the novels Homeland Elegies and American Dervish, as well as several plays, including Disgraced, for which he won the Pulitzer Prize for Drama. He is the recipient of the Steinberg Playwriting Award, the Nestroy Award, and the Irwin Piscator Award, among other awards, and is a board trustee at New York Theater Workshop in Pan America, where he serves as president. And Dina Mingestu is the author of the novels All Our Names, How to Read the Air, and The Beautiful Things That Heaven Bears. He is a recipient of the 2012 MacArthur Foundation Award, along with the Lannan Fiction Fellowship, the Guardian First Book Award, and the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, among other awards. And our moderator tonight, Elaine Blair, writes regularly for the New York Review of Books on literature, film, and television. So I'm going to turn things over to Elaine. Thank you, Hal. And thank you all so much for being here. And thanks to the audience, too, for joining us. Uh, I, sorry, I think I do want to start with a general question. And, you know, I think it's safe to say that novelists throughout the history of the novel have been writing about crises and figuring how they bear on the lives of individual people. And, you know, you can look at Tolstoy or Rushdie or Virginia Woolf or Roberto Bolaño or Toni Morrison, you can point in almost any direction and see writers writing about crisis. And you yourselves for years, well before the pandemic and before the Trump administration, were finding ways to reckon with how large scale societal calamities bear down on the lives of your characters. So part of me looks at fiction in a time of crisis and I think, as opposed to what? But another part of me thinks no, it's different. Something feels different. It's new and strange that we would just talk about a time of crisis without specifying the crisis that we're talking about, that we can just sort of assume and take for granted that everyone in the audience and our readers will feel caught up in at least one and probably more different crises. And it makes me wonder if a time of crisis isn't just sort of the sum of the acute problems that we're facing, but a kind of different national affective state. And so I, I wanna turn it over to you and just ask you as novelists, how you are seeing this time and how it's filtering in, into your writing. And if anyone wants to start, raise your hand or I will call on someone. Valeria, do you want to start us off? Why did I, I, I knew I was going to be picked on. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Um, well, I'm, I'm glad you prefaced um, the question this way and that you gave it so much context because when I received the invitation 
for this particular panel. I thought I was going to suffer from a bit of an imposter syndrome, thinking that you know, I haven't been doing a lot of fiction in this particular crisis. I've been doing crisis in this particular crisis, and that's that's been the mode. Um, so, uh, so I, I felt that that there was there was little that I could bring to the table uh, if we were going to speak about this particular period, um, at least as a writer, I think as a reader, um, fiction and returning to the fiction that I know has been, um, has been grounding, right? But, but as a writer, th this particular period has, has caught me off guard somehow. It, it's not a velocity, it's not the, the kind of intensity that I as a writer have ever been able to to relate with. Um, I have, however, as you say, what, what when is there not a crisis, right? There's all there is always some kind of crisis, and we have all all of us here have have written about moments of crisis, and um, I I particularly in the past uh, six years or so have been observing the unfolding ongoing diaspora of children arriving in the US to seek asylum and thinking about that question, right? How, how does fiction have any, um, any interaction? How does fiction really put together something that is unfolding? Um, and I don't have this as one singular answer for, for that, but, um, but I think often of, of uh, the, the Nicaraguan poet Ruben Darío, who used to speak about something called the art of distance. Um, and he thought about the art of distance as a way of, of understanding the space that one occupies as, as a writer or your space of enunciation, the, the place from where you speak and uh, the space of your your listeners, right? And that you particularly was thinking about the very complicated relationship, power relationship between um, the um, Frank, the Francophonic world, the English speaking world, and the often ignored Latin American world, right? And how to find a space as a Latin American writer uh, to be to be properly heard by the centers of power. Right, and um, and anyway, I mean, in this particular crisis, as as a Latin American writer in the USA, an important question for me has been how to find exactly that space. Right, I I speak about um, a community that has often been misrepresented over and over again in in American media, in American movies, in American music, and. Um, and so many, so many spaces of representation, and and the big question is how do I understand the art of distance, right? Um, how do I um, understand the, the the realities of a community, the ongoing changing realities of a community, but speak uh, in a language that power will will hear, so that I can get the message that I want to get across. Um, it's a complicated. It's a complicated. Um, balance, it's a compli complicated juggle. And one more thing that I'll say about this and I'll, I'll hand it over is that in the end, in the end, it doesn't matter too much what a writer writes, you know, like we'll, we're gonna make so many mistakes in the way we observe reality. We're gonna be so short-sighted. We see, we see so little of what we see. But uh, when we're writing about an ongoing crisis, especially, I think that the value of our testimony is that it is a testimony, that it is one layer in the multi-layered narrative that one day will become archive for others to be able to, um, to explore, refute, utilize. And when I think of particularly the, the thousands, hundreds of thousands of children who in the past 10 years have fled uh, Mexico and Central America, arrived in the USA, um, and who will eventually write their story when they're no longer children. All the layers that, that, I, that people in my generation have produced will be the archive that they can use, refute, 
um, mine for whatever they need to find there, right? And in, in that sense, uh, I think it's it's healthy for us to give not that much importance to to what we write and just understand that it is just this one little piece in the archive, right? Mm -hmm. Ben, do you want to follow up? I mean, I yeah, I don't. I mean, I, I like what Olivia is saying. Like, I I for me, the texture of this crisis has been the combination of a sense of interconnection and isolation, like that everybody has some mode of experiencing it as crisis. Like, I, I mean, on a very personal level, I just mean that I'm never see anyone outside of my household, but I'm never alone because I'm always with my kids. And so it's it's kind of it's it's both claustrophobia and isolation, but on a societal level, there's both um, a sense of an acute awareness of everyone's interconnection, um, and then also that that corresponding with so much isolation, which isn't to say there aren't mass you know movements and social upheaval of people coming together, but it's still coming together while having to like think about other bodies as conglomerations of spike proteins or whatever. So, and then it's also, um, while there's this like layer of shared experience of crisis, so much of it has been about the encounter of just like the mortally uneven relation to risk and labor and, you know, racial capital. So I think I, I, none of that is new. That's all continuous, like with, with the history of you know, America or whatever, but I do think it's, um, there is something about the texture of it, like, like being together and being alone, being interconnected, but being so acutely aware of the inequalities in that interconnection, that makes it feel um, like a kind of breaking point, just this kind of, I like, it's like that scene in The Godfather when she gets the abortion and she's screaming like, this thing has to stop, this can't go on. I just feel like there are like many different ways in which people of all sorts have reached a recognition of the like total bankruptcy of the dominant social order and the demand for a new language of, of politics and interconnection. And that is depressing and, and upsetting. And it's also really um, exciting. I think what's hard for me to try to think about the relationship of like fiction to all of this is that I think I think that that there's a pressure to be timely like there's a pressure to respond to the to the present and the danger in that is that you end up assenting to like the new cycles criterion of relevance but there's also a danger in being detached from the contemporary and being escapist or reactionary and so just as the crisis is about being together and apart i think the challenge for an artist might be um to be both of the moment and apart from the moment and that that dialectic that you work out in composition if you're writing um just feels more intense than ever before like nobody needs a novel uh, or a poem that's just for all the right things and against all the wrong things. That's just like merely programmatic. It somehow has to be that mixture of like proximity and distance that maybe Valeria is talking about too. So I don't know, I, I like how Valeria mentioned like reading because I, I feel like definitely the, um, the weird mixture of togetherness and apartness that is reading. That's the weird encounter with another mind through this old technology of writing. That's like presence and absence simultaneously. It's in the present tense of reading, but it's also from another time. It's like thought from the future and the past, uh, to paraphrase Timothy Morton. That has felt very sustaining and, and, um, and essential. So I, I feel like I maybe have more confidence than ever before in the necessity of reading, even though I don't have any uh, sense of what I should be writing. Are there particular writers that all of you are looking to at this time? Do you know? Yeah, <laughs> I think we're all so polite and we all know each other. I think we're all just, none of us want to make a uh, sort of step into the in, into the fray first. Um, although I was glad that Elaine, you called on Valeria. To, to start the conversation, um, you know, I, I mean, I, 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 you know, and I agree with the sentiment that there's this, 
you know, distinction to this particular moment in the sense that there is this sort of large scale thing which everyone feels somehow implicated in. Um, but I also, you know, to pick up on what Ben and Valeria were both noting, that there's also still within that large sense these nonetheless um, sort of singular ways in which this is not a collective experience, um, and and that and the differentiations into how that's not a collective experience, um, that the large tragedy or the large scale of of um, of tension and conflict are being felt in, in 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 much more sort of profound and unique ways in particular communities, and I can sometimes worry that our sense of like we're all in something together actually diminishes or sort of makes us complacent and losing sight of the fact that like the consequences are being borne much more heavily um, by particular communities and the pressure is felt inside of those communities both to navigate the sort of social. Um, crisis while also managing and navigating through these ongoing historical, economic, and political ones that are no less present now, even though they might seem that they are more collectively shared or understood. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of suspicion on that, 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 there's, that there is a real collective awareness emerging. I think historically we see that there are these flickers where people feel like, you know, there's a, a national consciousness or reckoning happening. But in fact, we sort of, once the dust settles, there's a kind of retreat into, you know, the sort of comfortable corners that we reside in. And, um, but the potential for that larger collective narrative deludes us from seeing that um, we will retreat into these, lar into these smaller, more, you know, comfortable corners. Um, and some things will continue to be perpetuated. So, um, so yeah, I don't, I mean, you know, I'm, um, I was actually reading a lot of Bologna this morning and, um, and with my students have been thinking, um, you know, much more about Morrison and Toni Morrison's essays, um, partly because I think they're trying to figure out exactly how to reconcile these things, how to kind of reconcile the making of, of these sort of literary artifacts um, while being very conscious to the present challenge and wanting to make sure that there's an aesthetic that can kind of um, be very conscious of that and, and trying to create that um, while also not turning in something that feels, you know, sort of been noted that's so of the moment that it's actually kind of really of nothing because it's, it's playing um, to the whims. And you know, I was actually reading um, parts of Lost Children Archive this morning, Larry, and, and actually I had some analogies. You know, these are all texts that are, are so conscious of the challenges being presented and that are actually sort of walking into them openly um, and, and interrogating the value of fiction to do that. And, um, but in that interrogation, still doing the work nonetheless of, of addressing it. Uh, I, I don't want to take time, and I yet hasn't said anything, but I do want to touch on something very quickly to what you, you're saying, Dina. Um, I wouldn't have been able to, to write the elegies within Lost Children Archive um, had I not uh, found or looked for that art of distance and found in literature um, so, so many great works um, of fiction about great migrations um and peregrinations throughout history that that um that framed the urgent present in so much a larger historical perspective right and um i remember reading in those those years um marcel shrub's children's um what is it called the children's crusade and uh, then this other brilliant book that i always recommend to everyone and i, I don't know if it's if it's available in, in English, I really hope it is, called The Gates of Paradise by Jersey Ellen Alexander Jowski. And it's, you know, I mean, there's always books that when I think we're writing and we, we hit a wall because we, we, at, we, we're conscious of, of what Ben was saying earlier, right? Like how, how do we not uh, circumscribe what we're trying to, to, to get at um, within the very confined um, time and geography of, of our of our of our moment, right? Mm -hmm. How how do we how do we go deeper into into um, historical truths? Um, and it's really only others, the writing of the fiction of others, that I think for me has always illuminated the way, has always given me 
that perspective that I, I myself can't, can't find easily. Mm -hmm. Suppose that silence means I have to speak now. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think that, that for me, the thing that fascinates me maybe more than anything else and has, has for a long time, both as a reader and as a dramatist and as a writer, um, is the social construction of subjectivity and how our interior states are really uh, a function of uh, our relationships. Um, I think the way that Plato puts it is that the city is the metaphor for the soul, that the thought experiment that is the Republic is not really um, a, a discussion about ideal uh, society. It's, it's a conversation about the structure of the human psyche and, so, and the societal psyche, that those two things are one. And um, I think that we are in a time of crisis. And by that, I'm not talking about the pandemic, though, of course, that's a crisis. I, I do think that there is a uh, there is a real crisis in our city, and I think that we are at a, a historical there's a historical you know juncture that we've arrived at that's been alluded to by some of the others on the panel, <clears throat> and I think that that's what animated my desperate uh, need to write uh, in the present uh, in the way that I just most recently did, uh, notwithstanding the very real you know. Um, dangers. I remember Salman Rushdie talking about the danger of writing about the present, that it was like a bullfight, that the present was like a bull. And if you weren't care careful, you were going to get gored. Um, and yeah, so, you know, you just never know if you're going to get gored. But I think that in a way, um, for, for me, at least as a dramatist and, and, and preoccupied by those themes and also meeting uh, the intensity of, uh, of affect and the intensity of, of incident uh, to animate my own imagination, it, you know, it feel, felt like a very natural thing to do, to write to what was going on right now. Mm -hmm. Well, let me switch gears a little bit. Ayad, you had been writing plays, you wrote three plays, uh, very highly acclaimed and prominently, and then you switched to the novel when it came time to write about the present and during the Trump administration. And I don't know if the form and the time is related, but I wonder if you could say what the novel allowed you to do that was different. To address, um, to, to address the reader directly and to, to, um, to summon, uh, a vo to, 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 to conjure or attempt to conjure a voice that would, uh, that, that would create a collective we, even if it didn't exist. I wanted to speak to all my fellow Americans. I didn't have an audience outside of everybody. And I, by that, I don't mean sales figures. I just meant some admittedly fictive and perhaps stupid idea that we are one as a nation and that there is some substratum of our subjectivity that we do share because we have one nation. And that if I could find a language in lyric, in prose lyric, that could summon that degree of emotion, collective experience, that, that maybe we could, I could, I could speak to it. I mean, it was you know, ridiculously arrogant, uh, but, but it, wasn't, you know, an, it wasn't born of arrogance. It was born of, of grief and, 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 and crisis. Um, so yeah, thank you for that question. Your, your narrator's his art or uh, the moment when he begins writing or I should say becomes a good writer and begins writing well is really forged in the crisis. I mean, he experiences moments of mortal terror uh, during the period after 9-11 because of anti-Muslim bigotry. And so his writing life is inseparable from the crisis. And then it kind of comes back around circularly because it's also about illuminating the crisis itself. He writes about the things that have happened to him once he has this moment of, of realizing that he has to face the sort of liminal position that he has in America as a non-white immigrant. And recognizing that is the crisis that sort of leads to the writing. I mean, it, it seems to me that the whole, the whole balance there is, I think Susan Sontag once said like an artist is, is exemplary sufferer, right? <laughs> So the difference between being an exemplary sufferer or being a mere victim. I mean, and, and I don't know what the alchemy is there and how one is transmuted or one is, you know, 
conveyed across that channel from one condition to the other, but, but merely being a victim is of course uninteresting. Um, but human suffering is a universal. And so finding a voice for that, obviously. So yes, I mean, everything you said is, yeah, spot on. Valeria, I wonder if we can turn back to you. You have written both a work of nonfiction about child migrants at the border and also a novel that touches on the same subject. And the nonfiction came out of your uh, volunteering as a translator in immigration court. And the novel also is about a character who through volunteer work becomes involved uh, emotionally and in her work in the same subject. And I wonder how it happened that you treated the same subject with both a, a book length essay and a novel and sort of what nonfiction allowed you to do that fiction didn't and vice versa. Yeah, um, great question. I also just want to say that somehow my father is in the chat and, <laughs> and is saying hi to us. <laughs> um, I, I began writing the novel with um, no intention to, to write um, about um, an on, the ongoing crisis, uh, but, but to capture in the novel a kind of atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, but because I was in those years, this was 2014-15, so still in the Obama administration, but that's really where, where, the, where the crisis hit Hit a hit a really um, high point. Uh, I I became involved with um, uh, with a group of organizations who were who were interviewing kids in immigration court and trying to find them lawyers. And I became involved in the capacity in a in, as a translator interpreter. And because I was writing the novel at that same time. I started doing what, what kind of happens to a lot of us, which is that I, I couldn't really think about anything other. Uh, so I then therefore couldn't write about anything other than what I heard in court. And I started to, to use the novel as a space in which to dump a lot of the um, confusion, frustration, um, anger um, that I was accumulating as a, as a listener, translator in court, but also um, I started to, to, to somehow fictionalize some of the stories that, that I was hearing until I realized that I was just completely messing it all up. Um, fiction was really not going to be the best vehicle for those stories to, to, to travel. Um, it felt unethical as well to, to, to listen and then somehow uh, shuffle and then fictionalize and then just put it in fiction and then say, okay, here we go. Um, so I was doing no justice to the situation, but I was also really drowning the novel with, um, with good intentions, but bad writing, um, kind of urgent ramble writing. And so I had to start writing it completely and then just commit to, to writing in a much more straightforward uh, testimonial, if you want, um, uh, essay that could be a way of denouncing what I was seeing as a close observer in court, and and that was that was tell me how it ends. And then I was able to go back once I finished writing tell me how it ends in English, and then again in Spanish, and I understood kind of the complexity of the situation once I'd written it in both languages. Only then did I really understand everything, or you not everything, but more of it. Sorry to interrupt, but you wrote it first in English and then in Spanish? I wrote it first in English, yeah, as a shorter essay. And then I gave it to my, my, um, my editors in Mexico who thought that I was a great betrayer of my mother tongue, the Virgen of Guadalupe, my nation in general, because I was now writing in the language of the empire. And so we had a meeting that is, they took me to, to Cantina and after the third tequila, they made me sign a napkin in which I committed to rewriting in Spanish everything that I dare write in the language of the empire. So I rewrote, tell me how it ends in, in Spanish 
and it became the book in English. Like the original version was an essay that Freeman, John Freeman published in Freeman's. Mm -hmm. And then the book form was post Spanish filter. Uh, it became a much more complex thing. But anyway, just to close this, I was able to go back to the novel once I'd written Tommy Howard ends and understand the novel, not as a political instrument, not as a, as a means to a political end, but as a, as a, as a novel, as, as a slice of life, as Andrejid used to say, where people pee and get divorced and have conversations and uh, suck their thumb uh, and not any kind of, um, not any kind of uh, pedagogical tool, right? Mm -hmm. Since you brought up ethical questions about how to write about some of these crises and scenes, um, I would like to I'd like to turn that out to everybody. And I'm specifically interested in the ethics about writing about violence. Danau, you have this great passage in your novel, How to Read the Air. Uh, your narrator works for a time at a refugee resettlement agency and one of his jobs is to take statements that refugees make about the persecution that they faced in their home country and to change them, to make them more compelling for the, uh, for the bureaucrats who will be reading and processing them. And uh, he, he describes taking plain statements made by refugees and he describes um, the way that he adjust them and you write, excuse me, let me just find it. You write, I took, or you, the narrator says, I took half page statements of a coarse and often brutal nature and supplied them with the details that made them real for the immigration officer who would someday be reading them. And he takes the phrase, they came at night, uh, said by someone whose village was attacked and he changes it into, we had all gone to sleep for the evening, my wife, mother, and two children. All the fires in the village had been put out, but there was a bright moon and it was possible to see even in the darkness, the shape of all the houses. That's why they attacked at night. And I really love the sort of uh, very taut moral ambiguity of this scene because there's nothing really so terrible or sensational about the way that he has elaborated the statement and he's doing it for a good cause to help someone get asylum in the United States. Uh, but at the same time, he is taking a plain personal statement and he's making it literary and he's adding detail that wasn't there. And of course, I couldn't help but make an analogy to the novelist in a certain way. And um, I wonder if you thought about it that way too. And you know, you have many scenes of violence in your work and I wonder both domestic violence and political violence. And I wonder if this is something that you have struggled with how to actually construct the scenes. Yeah, I mean, it, it's something that I, I, I've, I struggle with so much. I think I've, I've forced a whole semester of students to spend um, <laughs> this semester talking this through with me um, and, and trying to understand just how to, what the ethics of aestheticization are. And, you know, in the case of that little passage that you just sort of wrote, there's a way in which he's, you know, modifying or adapting something in order to fit into the sort of framework for what an audience, this white audience is going to sort of want, this audience that has power and authority. Um, and that seems to him like, you know, a, a definitely sort of a morally complicated situation. Um, but also at the same time, I mean, the thing I, I, I struggle with the most is, um, is how when you're taking these sort of especially experiences of violence that even if I've, I've, I've seen them or I've spoken to people closely and intimately and I've heard it from them, um, how am I sort of narrating them in a way that isn't just trying to kind of lyricize them or turn them into a kind of an, an ornate object. Um, and I think, you know, the, the one thing that I sort of keep coming back to is, you know, and Son Susan Sontag has in regarding the pain of others, this idea of, of the use of the like, right? That the, um, the, the taking the subject or the pain of others is, um, you know, maybe perhaps somewhat more 
possible when the idea is to one move the experience that's happened away from this sort of limited and isolated thing that has happened to this person in that place and how you how do you write about it in a way that moves it out of that sort of one limited temporal cultural political context into something that begins to feel like it might be attached or mended to a larger and more complicated set of experiences right like moving it towards the like and away from the thing that happened once um, and that to me is the is the thing that I sort of I, I I confront perhaps more explicitly now the more I think about it is the challenges of both being specific to the experiences that I'm writing about while at the same time um, presenting them and complicating them and drawing them into a relationship with things that are both a part of and also outside of them that are larger than them that kind of that shows the connective tissue that tethers all of these parts and pieces together. Um, sort of what you know, reminding me what Ayad was saying when you when you sort of take the the city as part of the self, right? You take the self and you try to locate it into this sort of larger whole. Um, and in the case of these experiences, it's trying to find a way to locate them, not just for the sake of the reader, but also because I think the complexity in which most things, like especially violence, exist, they do exist as parts of these larger cultural and political products and writing about them with that complexity is both an aesthetic act. Um, it requires a kind of conscious, deliberate interrogation of language and sentences, um, but also an ethical one because you're also showing these things in the, com in the most complicated and fullest light possible. Um, you're drawing the sort of connective bridge between two things that might not seem connected, but are. Would you be able to give an example of a particular scene or situation that you have been working on or have had questions about how to do it and maybe have worked on it different ways? Um, you know, I, I'll, I'll, just because it's what I was looking at this, this morning, it was sort of a passage from 266, the part about the crimes where he's, you know, describing these is writing about these obviously horrific violences, but then obviously tracing it from the very beginning to the rise of these machiadors in, in NAFTA in 1993. Um, and these parts, when you begin to look at them closely, you can begin to see that these experiences, the, the sort of collapse of an infrastructure, you know, around these communities, the use of NAFTA and the way that and the consequences of that as a political sort of economic document to kind of literally extract labor and resources out of Mexico, all of those things need to be kind of brought together. And that to me seemed like one interesting and sort of also, you know, there's always, it's always a problematic thing at the end of the day, but, um, but seeing the collusion of these different factors sort of brought to bear on something I thought was, was, was yeah, that's the most immediate thing I can, I can respond to. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else want to talk about either uh, dramatizing violence or the ethics of writing about it? Or we can move on. So do you, do you guys feel that something different is expected of you now at this time as writers of fiction, even just in your conversations with students or editors or anyone that you're in contact with now? Ben. <clears throat> I mean, I, th I think that the the part that's about that's not about writing that's like about teaching or conversation i mean i think there's a really important demand to think about it's not a new demand but it has a new urgency to think about whiteness and to think about the contemporary crisis as a crisis in and of white masculinity and to reckon with that to figure out what it would mean to reckon with that um in writing, but also in teaching and just like as a citizen or whatever. And, and that the history of the novel in which if you write about a white family, you're just writing a family drama. And if you write about a family of color, you're writing about a family of color, like that, that the implicit universalism of a certain 
normative white vantage has to really be declared and thought through. So that means all kinds of things, I mean, depending on the situation or conversation. And it, that's not the easy part in the sense that that work isn't easy, but it's the easy part in the sense that that's, it's just clear that that has to happen um, with all the discomfort that that involves. I mean, in terms of what's expected of a writer, I mean, I have, I, I feel like there, you know, I mean, I, I, I think there's like a kind of joke that's like, oh, like now all the novelists are going to write about Zoom or the novelists are going to write about masks or social distancing or hygiene theater or whatever. And there's, of course, like one could imagine all that being done really poorly. But I actually think like one thing that novels are good at, and I don't make a big political claim for this, but I think like novels are really good at tracking like small changes in the structure of experience that make a big difference. Like the mask, I mean, the mask is like fascinating, like what it's gonna do to relationships, like when, when is it gonna go away? How is it gonna go away? Like which masks or like hygiene theater or like all the Zoom disaster. I mean, you know, like it's like, there'll be a lot of bad writing about that shit. And then there'll also be like a Proust describing his first experience of a telephone call with his grandmother, like somebody really capturing in the old technology of the novel, a little shift in the texture of experience. And that seems to me to be a really valuable, pleasurable, sometimes hilarious, sometimes mournful thing that fiction can do. So I think, I think there's there's a legitimate expectation that some of the um, some of the small but non-trivial changes in like the way we interact with each other's bodies is going to show up in fiction and is either going to kind of break some inherited forms like it's going to require new you know ways of plotting just as like the cell phone is kind of introduced new relations of space if you want to actually take that on in a novel I think that there's there's been enough suspension of the normal experience of space and time that's just going to show up in exciting ways in fiction. I don't personally have very many ideas. Like I'm not writing anything that's doing any of that, but I'm looking forward to somebody doing that really well. I uh, say, it sounds like you should. You should. Yeah, well, <laughs> You're describing it so well. <laughs> yeah. But, but what if the mask, what if the mask Ben is like the the remember the mini disc you know I don't know if you fell into the trap and, and bought a bunch yeah, of mini discs but it could be right that like it's not it's a very like a, it's not not something that is going to shift our behavior because it's not going to be around long enough um, there might be this weird two year hiatus of of mask novels you know. But I mean, already when I've seen a couple of um, I've seen a couple of documentaries um, and a couple of fiction series where people are wearing masks, and it 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 already feels obsolete. And I don't I mean I wear a mask outdoors all the time, but there's something in the representation of the immediate present mm -hmm. that's so earnest mm -hmm. that almost feels like it's it's going to become obsolete immediately. It, it, people should be that there's large parts where that mask has never has never been that present um and and so i mean like some sort of winning like how does you know I, I totally agree with you ben that there's that what is this sort of doing to the way we you know communicate operate but also how is it for where where, where it doesn't actually have an effect right what is it doing to sort of you know, cleave these sort of, you know, um, our understanding or relationship when we even, when we sort of look back and there's one part of, you know, one part of the country that sort of remembers these experiences as sort of being really defined by, you know, this, this of, of having our faces shrouded and struggling to communicate through them. And another part that remembers feeling like they were, you know, sort of alienated or, or, or castigated or, you know, however that might be translated. Um, so, yeah. Elaine, I'd love to go back to for, for a second to the violence question, if I could. Is that I wanted to respond, but I wasn't fully there wasn't a full response there. Um, you know, I think the 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 dilemma for me as a dramatist is that audiences love violence, and and it, there's no better way to sort of get the audience really hooked into what you're doing than to sort of sharpen the edge and and ultimately really to to, to, to let it bleed, to have it bleed. Um, and I think that the, you know, the questions that, that 
around the ethics of that and whether that's ethical or not, you know, the balance is always, you know, don't do it in a way that crosses that line, but don't be so preoccupied by the ethics that you can't do it well to keep the audience's interest. And I think that, you know, anyway, that's, it's not connected to what we were just talking about. It's just been swimming around in my head because I'd wanted to respond to that, so. Thank you. I think we should leave time for questions from the audience. Uh, so I think Hal is going to come back. Yes. Hi, Hal. I'm back. Um, all right. We do have some great questions. I'm going to lead with a, uh, let's leave with uh, an apocalyptic one so that we can try to get ourselves towards some light. Um, so, so considering crises and the myriad crises that we do face, um, of, of varying uh, uh, sizes, how can fi fiction represent a crisis that might outlive us, something like climate change? Um, I'm gonna answer first, just because um, I, I have more doubts than, than answers and um, I wanna get my comment out of the way and listen to my <laughs> colleagues. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I've, I've been asking myself uh, this question very much especially when I, when I teach, um, uh, knowing and understanding with a lot of um, self-disappointment that I've n never been a writer that has paid uh, enough attention to the natural world and the environment. Um, I think that my, my experience as a writer has, has uh, been very preoccupied with, with human struggle and human interaction. And I, I think I've been very ignorant of, um, of the natural world. And I'm now asking myself, you know, if we, and when I say we, I mean, we as a, a very large we generationally um, started to pay more attention to writing about uh, mountains and rocks and rivers and, and rainfall, would we be able to generate really a deeper change of consciousness um, through our writing? Like, can we really engage with, nat with nature in a way that's not uh, so extractive, but write about it um, and observe it deeply, not, not, um, not to unveil its mysteries as I think a lot of nature writing somehow uh, tends to do, but, but as to, to really like, generate a deeper narrative connection with writing and I, and I think about it as a, as a professor, as a teacher, because I think that this generation is much, that the younger generation is much more aware. They've already grown up, um, they're, they're growing up with a sense of end of world that I think we didn't grow up with. And I, um, I do a lot of exercise, exercises with them in which they, they do write about, about rocks and mountains and rainfall. And my feeling is that their sense of connection with, with the natural world around him is, is much deeper. Does anyone else want to jump in before I ask another question? Please, please answer. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a colleague who was, who was uh, talking about the ways in which actually, you know, that concern for the climate is actually something you can, you can find and trace back to even Victorian literature that this isn't necessarily a new thing that, you know, you, in the 19th century, you know, writers were already imagining and beginning to sort of imagine the consequences for what was happening to their cities. And so it seemed kind of even more radical then, but the necessity of imagining beyond the sort of temporary world and moment that we live in, um, as you know, historically felt really pressing specifically in issues related to climate. And so I think it's, it's we're always looking when that's the sort of case one, you're always thinking of the moment that we are in, um, but also obviously thinking about the things that we sort of can't see or witness. Um, I mean, and I also, I mean, I always feel like too that we're, what we sometimes have a hard time imagining other people are already living. Um, so, you know, the consequences for climate change are they exist, they're real, they're happening. They are, you know, when you sort of see, when I see migration happening in large, large parts of Africa and they see conflict and tension, so much of that is already connected to degradations of the environment. Um, so it's both, I think, a question of kind of like looking more closely at what we, what is happening now 
um, and understanding how it's actually affecting other parts of the world in ways that might give us more more purchase on that rather than thinking of them as these sort of dis distant experiences. And maybe the lens of climate becomes one way of possibly doing that because it's not, you know, that those experiences are, are, are not, we're not immune from them. And climate change is one thing that actually shows that's going to be the case. So. Uh, well, so, so an inversion of this question that somebody else posed that I think would be productive to get into, um, is there space for works about crises of the self uh, in an age of so much social and global, global calamity? Ben. Uh, yeah, I mean, I feel like there's, I mean, one is one is the kind of obvious thing about the the self is a node in the system, and like what one of the things that artworks do is show how like the intimate in our intimate life we register and are constituted by like broader social crisis, and that's part of the like knowledge and pleasure and pathos and comedy of a novel, right, or of a of a work of art is it's this it's it's this trick of scale where like basically unfigurable large scale crises can be made to be felt. Um, and you can also imagine the small ways that individuals can, or, or like small publics can be some kind of counterweight to the catastrophe sometimes. But uh, I mean, that can go wrong, right? Like you can retell the whole history of the Russian revolution as like the struggle of a bourgeois marriage or something. And then, and then what you get is you kind of domesticate this big historical event into people um, into kind of like domestic passion or whatever. But you, I think it can be done well too. I mean, but also I just think, I mean, I, 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 I think it's really important to think about the, the, the role of art in a crisis and what it registers and how it might be a counter value. And I also think it's like, I, I think if, but we also have to just like defend pleasure or not defend it. It's 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 indefensible, but it, there has to be a space for the indefensible in literature. If what you get in literature is only what you can justify in extra literary terms, then you get like the merely programmatic, and it ceases to be the weird wager of wrestling with the language. Where like part of what's interesting about artworks is what they get wrong, like like an author's wrong desire and wrestling with the materials and blind spots and ideological particularity, like totally defies her intention or partially defies her intention. And, and you get this thing that is not um, only, you know, the, the, the beliefs, the, the, the righteous beliefs, the political commitments of the writer, but you get the weird slippages and possibilities of language or whatever. So, I mean, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that there, that the, I, I can't imagine works of art that would really matter if they didn't have a space both for the small scale, and I even think that has a political function, but I also can't imagine what the point of literature would be if there wasn't also contingency and, um, and, and the indefensible. Mm -hmm. uh, Ayad, can we get you in on this too? Sure. Um, you know, crisis political, whatever. I mean, it's, it's a great um, catalyst of, of, of uh, revelation um, in the sense that uh, as it just as somebody who thinks a lot about drama, I think that um, I'm always looking for crisis in, in the work. Um, and if you've got one that you can work with, it can, it can be helpful. Um, you know, and I, you know, just to echo a lot of the things that Ben said, I mean, I don't really know what's worth doing if, you know, making work that is meaningful and powerful um, is any less meaningful or powerful because, you know, the world is in the state of crisis. I think it still is meaningful and powerful. And maybe some of the, some of the stuff that people are worried about is makes, you know, it can become part of the work that you're doing. So. Um, and, actually, you know, jumping from um, one little thing that Ben did say, uh, and spinning it around in my own head and, and attaching it to this other question. Um, uh, it, one of our viewers was asking about, you know, older forms of storytelling, such as the fable, which would end with a moral. Um, do you think that, you know, in a time of crisis, like we are, we seem to be perpetually inside of now, 
do you think that modern forms of fiction should or could uh, have, you know, some kind of responsibility to a moral, um, any kind of core that would be communicating right or wrong? Um, I, I mean, I was slightly drawn to this question just because of the, the court case today. Um, what you know, but 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 then but then dra dragging this across over to fiction, over to aesthetics. Um, do you know you 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 kind of got into this earlier about the aestheticization, excuse me, of violence. Um, do you want to maybe maybe think about this? Yeah, you know, I don't, I I definitely don't want morals um, because <laughs> just because they're they're. They're, they're they're problematic and and they're not, not because they're problematic. Let me sort of reframe that. Um, you know, there's there's certain things that that are clearly sort of inherently wrong, and I don't need a fiction or novel or a story to kind of jump in front of me and tell me that. Right? That's not necessarily sort of interesting. Um, there's you know, I don't need a novel to tell me that what happened to George Floyd was 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 terrible. Um, but what I do need is a literature that's going to um, not just take that particular incident and treat it as a particular incident that can be used as a moral fable to help me understand the badness and the goodness of both sides, but I, I need a story that's going to unwind and unspool that particular experience and tether it to many other things that I might not be able to see or witness in my own limited gaze. Um, and then to draw me into that space and actually move me away from a simple moral certitude into something that's far more ambiguous and complicated. There's, a, you know, at the end of uh, Fanon's Wretched of the Earth, he does this wonderful profiles of, um, of both French colonists and soldiers who tortured people and also the people that they tortured. And they all exist in the same space of the asylum. Um, Fanon was, was as complicated as he was. One of the things he understood is that everyone becomes sort of victim um, when these tragedies and in these sort of spaces. And so the simple moral, moral quality doesn't do what I want literature to do, which is to upset and kind of upend a certainty. Um, it doesn't mean I, I can't have a clear sense of what was wrong and what was right. That doesn't get diminished, um, but it becomes more problematic and it becomes richer, um, hopefully. I have a quick thought I could just uh, share about that, I, or just a, con, a question of my own, which is that I'm not so preoccupied about coming up with a moral or no, having the knowledge about you know what a situation, what the good would be in a particular given. Uh, although I'm often accused of that, but um, I think it's more about having the an understanding of what um, what the form is ideological in in my experience, and that sometimes meanings are communicating themselves through forms that I've chosen to, to, to work with or that I'm fascinated by. And so it's to not let the form communicate its, its own message without me understanding uh, what that message might be or might be communicating itself through me, so. Um, all right, I think that we have time for one last question. We can make this sort of a lightning round and get everybody in. Um, trying to end on a positive note, do you see any opportunities for fiction coming out of this crisis? Again, it's hard to say out of this crisis because I feel like even with this series, we batted back and forth after Biden was elected, like, well, should we rename it? Nope, here we are. Um, do, do you feel, you know, even moving, moving through a period of vaccination into, into less masks, less social distancing, um, or even, just being able to like go see people. What are the opportunities that you might be be eyeballing with in your fiction writing brain? These are. I'm sorry. I'm rephrasing these in the in just the wildest way. I mean, if schools reopen and the kids start actually leaving the house and, <laughs> and letting us write, and if like the cook the, the the food cooks itself in the kitchen three times a day, maybe maybe we'll all right again um but um but that aside um i think i i don't have a super optimistic um outlook for the fiction that is to come uh in out of this um because i feel that um we have lost a lot of common space a lot of 
commonality, common ground, the, the space of the table where we would have a discussion after dinner with our friends and the space of the classroom we've recovered to a degree, but a lot of us through Zoom. Um, the space of going to an exhibition together and discussing if it was really bad or really good or why would we like, we have lost a lot of space of conversation. And I remember the first few months uh, into the pandemic, struggling so much to finish an essay that I was trying to write. Usually an essay that would have taken me a couple of months, it was a long essay, it, it required a lot of me, it took me quadruple the amount of time. And it wasn't only the cooking and the kids and the Zoom school and all of that, it was something else. And I think that it was the absence of interlocutors, the absence of my, the, the minds of my peers. And there are the books, okay, like there's at least that, like I remember at some point looking at the bookshelf and almost in a religious way asking for help, <laughs> saying just talk to me, to say something. And of course there's that, there's that space, we can always communicate with the dead through our books and um and that is a possibility but but we also need the the indefensible we need the, the messy space of of unfinished conversations and and i or at least i know that my fiction relies a lot on that um and so i i think uh, a lot of us that 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 maybe rely on it will need a few years um to understand either how to do it a different way or to recover the lost space uh, of, of intimate and vibrant conversation before we can jump in again. And what do you think? I mean, I don't, um, I, it makes me think about this thing. I had this moment when Trump won the election. Um, I mean, when he won the first election, not when he claimed to win the second election, but when he, when he was elected, uh, I got these two emails, like, and they were from poet friends, and they were kind of, they were they were joking and they were serious at the same time. And one of the emails was, like, finally we can give up on literature. Like, you know, like the forces of white reaction have triumphed so thoroughly that like we don't even have to fool ourselves anymore. Like, it just doesn't matter. We can quit. And then the other email with like the same level of half joking and half seriousness said, like, finally literature is going to matter again like we're going to be like Mandelstam like they're gonna they're gonna you know they're gonna gun you down in the street and like they were both they were again they were like both joking and both not joking and I feel kind of that way about this moment too like on the one hand it makes like what is you know I think there was like a Saturday Night Live skit about this recently like what like what could be less essential than like being a poet now right like I mean it's just like it's like never been clearer the degree to which my labor, such as it is, is totally dispensable. And then at the same time, I have this sense that like, oh, like small scale counter publics trying to figure out how meaning is made, like trying to figure out like what little alternative histories might be constituted on the page, like trying to imagine, you know, a way of valuing sensation that, that isn't leveled by Amazonian neoliberalism, et cetera, et cetera, like that that kind of seems important. Like it seems like more important. So that is just to say that like, I, I mean, I'm not optimistic, but like, I feel like in you, like you, in a moment of accelerating unevenly experienced interlocking crises, you have to love what you love more intensely. And so I kind of, I can, I can despair or I can also feel like a different level of resolution depending on, on the quality of light. I had, how do you feel, optimistic or pessimistic about the work? And Dinab, get ready. You're getting last word, man. Um, I feel like uh, it could be, um, the pandemic could be a great dramatic circumstance for a great story. Um, I think uh, Thomas Mann would do something really great with uh, that as a circumstance. So I'm excited to see if that happens. <laughs> okay. I, I don't know if I'm optimistic for myself, but I'm, I, I am optimistic when I, when I think of sort of like one sort of decentralizing, like what gets sort of made and how it gets made. And when I think of, I don't know, I've, I have the feeling whether it's sort of naive that there will be just many more different types of narrative experiences being made. And that will be made by especially sort of minority communities that like right now we sort of are actually are like dominate and lean and gravitate heavily towards like the sort of literary 
thing. And I feel like there's just a need and will be a rise in just many more different types of like l creation with language that won't necessarily look like the novel as we're comfortable with, or, or that might be, you know, different genre forms of the novel that will just take and run with these stories and these forms and have more to say with them than I think um, have been said before. So that I'm really optimistic about. Great. I think it's uh, more fun. <laughs> well, I mean, we're all looking forward to more fun. Um, you're all invited to a barbecue. I'll, I'll, I'll send out an email. Uh, thank you all of you for joining thank us tonight, um, panelists and attendees. Um, and uh, uh, I mean, I, again, I wanna give a, a huge thanks to Elaine and NYRB for uh, uh, putting together tonight's panel for moderating. Um, and again, Dina, Ayed, uh, ben, Valeria, thank you so much for your time, for joining us tonight. Um, everybody who's watching, very important thing before we leave, um, the chat does just get completely shut down. I am posting a link to a special offer from NYRB for uh, a subscription, um, only for tonight's attendees, so please click on that. Um, I myself need to resubscribe. Um, and then other than that, uh, everybody be safe, be well. Um, we're, all, we're, all, we're all somewhat optimistic, right? I, I don't know, come on. There's a future. Thank you all. Good night. Bye, good night. Good night.